hopefully everyone can see this. Sorry, Brandy. <laughs> Um, so, welcome to our application review team training. Our mission at United Way of the Greater Chippewa Valley is re improve lives and build stronger Chippewa Valley communities by bringing resources together to advance the common good. Any information or supporting documents regarding the um, application can be found on our website here. Uh, we will, Kelly and I will be referring to this website because we've kind of made it to be the one stop shop for our applicants and reviewers because it has all these kind of supporting documents and also allows you to take a glance at what the applicants are filling out. Right here is Kelly and I's uh, information. I, I think you all have my email address because you've I've been sending you emails. But feel free to reach out to either of us if you have any questions or concerns. Uh, if you have specific questions related to an initiative question, a question that is specific to an initiative on the application, we have uh, here are the, the initiatives that we both cover. And if you have any general questions, feel free to give us a call at our office. All right, so. Since this is most of y'all, this is your first rodeo, I will go and explain what community impact is by illustrating a fun story. All right. So here's the story. A villager is walking by the river one early morning, and the villager looks into water and sees a baby floating down the river. The story gets better, I promise. Horrified. The villager races into the water and grabs the baby and brings the baby to shore. The baby is fine. Relieved, the villager looks back into the water and sees another baby floating down the water. The villager again dives into the water and rescues this baby as well. Once more, the villager looks into the water and sees dozens of babies floating down the river. The villager calls out an alarm and the entire village comes running to the river to rescue as many babies as they can before the water carries them away. This is a village that is mobilized. Every villager is at the river trying to save the babies from the water. This is a village that is improving lives. Many of the babies are being saved, but the babies keep them on coming because no one is going upstream to put a stop to the ogre that is throwing the babies into the river in the first place. Our, the community impact approach would say, instead of just waiting down the river to save the babies, we as United Way need to gather a contingent group of villagers to go upstream and stop the ogre. Otherwise, we'll be pulling babies out of the water forever. Don't get us wrong, pulling babies out of the water is essential, but how do we live with our lives if we don't try? But it is by going upstream to redirect the ogre and put its energies to better use that we create lasting change in the conditions that are causing this nightmare to begin with. All right, so that is kind of illustrating what community impact is. Uh, and here's kind of a diagram of what it is. So community impact is focusing on the education, financial stability and health um, pillars as United Way Worldwide calls them with us kind of tackling the root causes and creating long term. Um, the long term prevention in the end with uh, each of the initiatives kind of focusing on these statements here. But we also recognize that basic needs is a need in the community. So those are for those basic needs is targeting the short term girls goals. So if you need a place to stay tonight, um, we support organizations that will be able to do that. If you need a meal right now and you're hungry, we support organizations that can provide you with a meal. Also, feel free to pause uh, to ask any questions during any time. All right, so how did we kind of come up with these 
the main focuses of these each initiatives. So each initiative has a group of individuals called advisory councils who are experts in their um, area. And so with their assistance, we were able to develop action plans, which really allowed us to really focus on the specific needs of our community. These action plans were started in 2014 when we first implemented the community impact model and have been updated with each grant cycle. So if you're brand new to the area like me and have no idea what the community needs are, then action plans are a great resource to look into and they're also available on our website. All right, community outcomes. So community outcomes are how we quantify if we're moving the needle in the, in the direction we'd like for it to go in a very positive way. So each, uh, each applicant is required to complete outcomes, and we also use this for um, reporting as well, but it just gives us a number to let the know, community know that we're making an impact. So previously, um, the, the first year that we went to uh, the community impact model, um, all of the initiatives measured their own outcomes. Um, and so when we got the data, um, we weren't really able to do much with it because it was all so different. Um, and so uh, we went to the community outcomes where um, every organization within each one of these initiatives um, that Isabella talked about, education, financial stability, and health, are all measuring the same outcomes. Um, and then we are able to combine those, uh, that data, um, and, and look at, um, look at the community as a whole um, as we're doing it. So really looking at um, using data uh, to d drive our decision making, drive the bus, if you will, um, and to show that community impact. Very much data driven. Everything we do is data driven. Yeah. All right. Referring back to the action plans, from these action plans, we establish bold goals. So what we think what our advisory councils think is the top priority of each initiative. So with health, we established that mental health of the Chippewa Valley residents will improve uh, will improve by utilizing prevention and intervention programs. Education established that children in the Chippewa Valley will be school ready to succeed. And financial stability is Chippewa Valley residents will achieve self-sufficiency through employment training and personal money management skills. Last, basic needs, Chippewa Valley residents will have access to food, shelter, and medical services in their time of need. All right, Alice, so does anyone know what Alice is? And don't look at my screen. <laughs> It's an Alice, a report that um, is kind of done to see. I guess I always think of Alice as the report that kind of shows what percentage of people are um, are like struggling with food insecurity or um, uh, issues with unemployment. And that isn't that kind of the gauge that is used to determine where funds should go? Yes and no. So. <sighs> You're close. You yes. your, you're close. Your answer is about 50% correct. Uh, so I was I was actually in a webinar earlier and someone described Alice as kind of the working poor. Um, so Alice stands for Asset Limited Income Constrained and Employed. These are the, the individuals and or households that live paycheck to paycheck. So they make above the federal poverty line, um, but just maybe even a few dollars above the federal poverty line. They don't make, they make too much to be able to qualify for any programs and assistance programs, but they are still making too little to be able to kind of establish like savings. And if you want to know more about our Alice report, uh, it is available on our website. We have reports for the entire state of Wisconsin we also have it for uh, Eau Claire and Chippewa County uh, that we really emphasize the Alice report because there are questions in the application 
that ask how the program is going to serve the Alice population. So our um, our target population, um, each initiative has its own target population, um, but we're really in, in addition to that, we're targeting um, those that are at or below the Alice threshold. Doesn't mean that everybody has to be at that, but that's who we're really targeting. All right. What is our community investment process? Our service delivery is that we serve both Eau Claire and Chippewa counties. So we support communities and villages and towns from New Auburn to Lake Holcomb to Cadott, <laughs> Stanley, Augusta, Fall Creek, parts of Fairchild, uh, not to mention our Chippewa, Chippewa Falls and Eau Claire. That is who we serve. So we fund programs, not agencies. So before we implemented the community impact model, we supported organizations that did great work. But because we established community impact, we are supporting programs that target specifically towards our bold goals. We are, we currently do a three year funding cycle. So uh, we are accepting applications right now with the application cycle beginning July 1st, 2022 and ending June 30th, 2025. And we allocate or invest uh, roughly a million dollars per year, so $250,000 per initiative. Just because an agency is uh, and a program is currently funded um, with this funding cycle does not mean that they will be funded the next funding cycle and doesn't give them bonus points. Um, you know, so everybody is starting at the same, you know, ground level. Um, as we move into this next uh, funding uh, funding cycle. And the needs of the community could very much change in the next grant cycle. And that is also another reason why we implemented the community impact model, because we wanted our um, the way we approach the needs of the community to kind of evolve um, to kind of support the evolution of what the needs are in the community. So just because mental health is, is the focus of the health initiative right now, doesn't mean that it'll, it will still be the main target um, for the next grant cycle. All right, so what is this fun looking little chart puzzle that I have to follow? All right, this is also in your evaluator training manual. This kind of just lists uh, the different hands that the applications will go through from kind of start to finish. And if you follow the arrows, you'll kind of see who which group is responsible for what and how it eventually how a program eventually becomes um, supported. And this is the review process from um, kind of a summary with the dates on it from start to finish. So applications are due on July 30th, so next week. Um, and then Kelly and I will begin kind of a check process to see if all the required documents that we need are there. And then during the second week of August, we will send out applications to the application review team, so y'all and the finance review team. You'll have until about September 3rd to review the applications and then in September 2021, the applications that do meet a point threshold will go on to present a 30 minute presentation to our grant review panelists who consist of advisory council members. <clears throat> From there, the advisory councils will make recommendations to um, to the community impact committee and um, and then it goes on to those recommendations then go to the executive committee with the board of directors finally voting on um, those recommendations in December 2021 and grant recipients being announced December 27th. And we 
we do go through an extensive review process because we also want to have that integrity integrity with our our um, community members and our donors. So it's not just a one and done review. It goes through, I think, seven sets of hands. <laughs> All right, here is another table kind of showing, kind of explaining a bit more of the responsibilities of each review party. Um, like I said, Kelly and I are just are screening applications. Um, and then you'll see each of the respective reviewers with the final score being um, the application score, which is the part that you'll be reviewing is worth 30%, the financial review score is worth 20%, and the grant panel is worth 50%. All right, roles and responsibilities of y'all, well, of our organization. <laughs> the vision of the United Way of the Greater Chippewa Valley is to make an impact on complex problems, reducing need and increasing quality of life. We've already discussed our bold goals and the core values and ethical principles are available in our evaluator training manual. But a few things I did want to emphasize here is the confidentiality and conflicts of interest. Uh, just regarding confidentiality, we, we know that y'all are kind of connected in different ways in the community. So if you have a colleague or friend that's asking, hey, I submitted a grant, um, who do you think is reviewing it? Um, you cannot share that information with them because we want the information that you're reviewing to stay between yourselves and us, the staff. Um, so they can't bribe you and you cannot accept any bribes with like mini muffins or any of that. And next thing is conflicts of interest. So it is here in blue, italicized, underlined, bolded. Why? Because, um, for one, we do not know who is applying until the application deadline on July 30th. So um, from there, we will be sending out a conflict of interest. And we emphasize the conflict of interest because if you do not send it, to back, send it back to us that first week, you will not get a chance to review applications and it may delay the process of it may delay the amount of time you get to review the application. So please send us the conflict of interest as soon as possible. I'm talking like hopefully within a day of you receiving the email. So. Um, we have about 50 of you um that will be reviewing applications we have eight people that will be doing the financial reviews um and so it's a giant it's two giant puzzles that we have to do um we have to address every conflict of interest that each of you may have um so we will have a giant spreadsheet that will have you know 50 50 names on on one side and uh probably 50 to 60 program names across the top um, and we have to eliminate those those conflicts of interest. So um, it is a giant puzzle. It's going to take us a little bit of time, um, you know, to get things done. So the the quicker you can get your conflicts of interest back to us, um, the quicker we will be able to get you assigned to a team, um, and that team will review the same applications. Um, so team A is going to do, you know, application X, Y, and Z. Um, and you will be the only ones doing X, Y, and Z. So we want to not only create, we want to not only create a team, but um, then we have to create a team that will also be able to review the same applications. Um, so in my mind, this is going to be probably one of the hardest things, and maybe not hardest, but time-consuming things um, that that Isabella and I are going to have to do um, during this process. So the more time that we have, the more time we'll be able to give to you. So please, hey, Kelly. please get this in as soon as possible. Yes. What are you considering a conflict of interest for so, an organization? Yeah, so we've defined that. Um, and when you get it, you'll be able to, you know, be able to tell, um, you know, it's you working for an organization or a spouse, um, 
uh, being on a board of directors, things like that. I mean, pretty obvious things. Um, you know, uh, I'm not sure if volunteering is on there or not. If you volunteer for an organization, um, I can't remember if that's on there or not, or if you uh, make a donation to that organization. Um, but definitely if you are a spouse or a child probably works for that organization, or if you're on the board of directors or a spouse is for sure those kinds of things. I have a question. Yep. When will we know if volunteers follow under that category? Because I like volunteer at the Bolton Refuge House. So um, actually, while Isabel is talking, I can take a look at that and, and just determine. But even if you have a conflict of interest, that's OK. Because, you know, okay. with one organization, because we've got like 50 other ones that you may not. OK. Um, OK. So. One conflict isn't going to be bad. Now, last time there were some folks that were so connected to the community um, that they were not able to do any evaluations um, or reviews because they were so connected. Um, that may happen with you. You may end up, we may end up not being able to place you on a team because you're so, you know, so connected. But um, I'll, yeah, I'll double check while Isabella is talking and see if I can't find that. All right. Any other questions besides that one? All right. So, oh, how will you be accessing the chairs for the applications? Um, as we mentioned before, the action plans for the education, health, and financial stability are available on our website and the funding guidelines are there for basic needs. We will be utilizing Dropbox to, to as our, our main site for accessing the application materials and the evaluation form. I wanna ask this now, but does anyone or will anyone think they have issues with Dropbox? All right, <laughs> good. Um, if issues, if you do have issues or that do come up with Dropbox, please send us an email as soon as you can. Um, and then maybe we could use, if you have a personal email address, maybe that could work and we can just um, share the link with you via that way. All right, as Kelly mentioned, you'll be into, uh, you'll be in groups of three to four reviewers and each reviewer will have four to five applications to review. Um, we do not know how many applications were, uh, we will be getting, but I believe last time it was about 50 applications total. Mm, yeah. So we're, I think we're looking at anywhere between 50 to 60 applications, but that is not for certain. Yeah, so we're hoping that we can, you know, divide the um, applications out, you know, relatively evenly amongst everyone and um, with the minimum amount of work um, that we would need to have. So um, we say four to five applications here. I'm hoping it's like more like three to four, but um, a lot will depend upon um, how many applications we actually get and then also how many um, coming interests. Uh, yeah, how many reviewers were actually able to use? Yeah. This is kind of an example of how the folder will look like. So you'll be assigned a folder that is labeled similar to this. It will have the abbreviation of the initiative. So either BN for basic needs, FS for financial stability, H for health, E for education. And then it'll be team A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A through Z, and double letters if we need. Inside that folder will be the application review team evaluation form. And then um, there will also be the program, the application folders. So it'll have, I can't see my mouse, it'll have the abbreviation of of the initiative followed by 
an abbreviation of the organization followed by the program name. So I know it's kind of a lot, but um, this is similar to how it'll be labeled inside the folder. And then inside that folder will be the applications and attachments. All right, this is an example of what the folder will look like. Uh, you will have a team A, team B, C, D, F. Um, here's the organization, the program folder. And inside this folder will be the uh, attachments and applications. And if you click on it, right now you'll see a picture of a dog. Oh no! All right, you'll see a picture of a dog. Um, and you'll be able to, I believe, download and open these documents as well. Clicking on wrong things. All right, oops. Here we go. Any questions about Dropbox, any of the sort? All right. If you would like to take a look ahead of time, the the review forms are available on our website. Um, they're right here. And uh, you won't know which initiative you'll be receiving, but if you would just like to kind of know what we're asking ahead of time, they're available for you to look at. And these review forms are also available for our applicants to look at. All right. Oops. So. I will show you an example of what the evaluation form looks like here. Each evaluation form is divided into five sections that reflect the number of sections in the application. I will go over the attachments in a little bit and the scoring in a little bit as well. But looking at the evaluation form, it will have kind of a statement and then a reference application question. So this lets you know which question or document to look at specifically regarding this statement. Right. So something new that we have added um, to our application this year that is kind of different from previous years is we've added a diversity, equity, and inclusion question. We understand that diversity, equity, and inclusion is um, is an kind of a very sensitive topic, especially given recent events. But and it also might be a challenge because both counties are over ninety percent white. But we also want you to think about diversity, equity, and inclusion in other ways, such as socioeconomic status. And we also know that diversity, equity, inclusion may not be at the forefront of everyone's mind. So that is why we kind of divided this statement into two parts, you could say. So if a program has, has developed a program and it's great, then they get a maximum of two points. If they have a pro plan and it's already being implemented, they get a maximum of four points. We just did not want, and he's disconnecting again. We just did not want organization programs to be um, deducted a large number of points if they didn't have a plan. All right, and if you have any comments, uh, feel free to leave them here in the boxes. And if there are any questions that you may have or come up while you're reviewing the application, please leave it in this box. Um, and they will be asked during, by our advisory council members during the grant review panel. So everything that you write on here will stay between yourself and then Kelly and I. It will not be um, shared with anyone else. And I will be going over the attachments. So the attachments for attachment B is an organizational chart. Sorry, we're kind of just wanting to see if that it's clear and concise and doesn't look like a giant maze. 
Regarding attachment C, they should uh, applicants will be including their board of directors, um, kind of ensuring that they have a, a diversified uh, set of experience among their board of directors. So making sure that all of them don't just come from Mayo Clinic, for example, you want to make sure that they come from different areas, um, different professions. And then attachment A, uh, this is referenced in two statements in this section. And section four. So attachment A is a program budget. Let me zoom in one more time. That may be a bit much. Sorry. Can everyone see that sort of? All right. So attachment A is a program budget. So what we're looking for in this program budget is if the number of individuals they're planning to serve is um, makes sense for the for the amount that they're asking for, and is their budget appropriate for the services that they'll be providing. So a few things here. Uh, this part in this green column, making sure that it's 50% or less. It can't be 50.08%. It has to be less than 50. And um, the funding requested from United Way of the Greater Chippewa Valley right here is equal to the uh, total expenses right here, which is the expenses supported by United Way of the Greater Chippewa Valley. Um, and also kind of looking at their expenses just to make sure that it makes sense. Uh, so if all of their funding is kind of going into staff, um, that's okay because staff is an important part of a program, but kind of making sure that it's not going towards like office supplies or phone or, um, or other type of things. Um, so that's what you're gonna be looking at. So administrative costs are OK, um, but I think, you know, what we're what we're looking at is are they using United Way funds for all administrative costs? Um, you know, we understand that you need to have that infrastructure in order to run a program. Um, so admin is OK, but um, is everything going into admin or is, you know, is it going, you know, someplace else? Um, as well. There's kind of no right or wrong answer um, on this one. It's just kind of, it's just kind of doesn't, does it make sense? It, you know, um, you know, that first column, that blue column is just a general budget, you know, your revenues that are coming in versus your expenses that are going out um, is really what that is. Um, if this revenue coming in is more than the expenses going out, my first question would be, well, then you're asking for too much money from United Way. Um, if the revenues match the expenses, that's kind of what we like. Um, and if the revenues or if the expenses are exceeding the revenues, um, that's not necessarily all that uncommon for a nonprofit. Um, but is is the um, is the difference you know, a couple of thousand dollars or is it a couple of hundreds of thousands of dollars? Um, and then that gets into the financial wellness of the organization as a whole. Um, you won't have access to all of that information, but if, you know, you saw a budget that, you know, showed a $200,000 deficit um, in a program that was $300,000, um, I would be questioning whether or not they, actually have the capacity to administer this program. Yeah. So don't, don't get too hung up on this. These questions. Um, it really is. Does it does it seem to make sense? Is the number of individuals they're planning to serve make sense for the budget? If they're requesting $100,000 and they're only planning to serve two people, that kind of draws a red flag. <laughs> um, and <laughs> And then the flip side, you know, if they plan on serving a thousand people for, you know, a thousand dollars, that obviously is going to throw up a red flag as well. That's it may make 
sense for, you know, a, I guess a food provider, maybe. Um, but it may not make sense for maybe a night of shelter. Right. Um, so we kind of just want to know that then that the amounts that they're uh, requesting and in their budget makes sense for the number of individuals that they're planning to serve and for the quality of work the staff is providing. And there are questions in the application that state that ask the qualifications of the staff. Any questions on the budget? Is it scary? Is it not scary? I had a quick question on where it shows the number of people that the program serves. Does it say it on this page somewhere? It does not, but I can pull up an application so that it will probably make more sense by doing oh. that. OK, um, as you. an example. Great question. So I will, I'm going to zoom in a bit more. Hold on. So this is uh, what our application looks like ahead, um, for. This is what it looks like. It's divided into the five sections. But in this outcome, one of one of the tables here, they have to state how many individuals that are planning to serve annually. Um, and it's broken down into towns and villages and counties as well. So this kind of total right here. Thank you. And uh, and then there was the question about the staff, which I think is up here. So how, what is the organization's qualifications? How will the staff be trained? So those are the questions that relate to the budget. And also here is um, that one of one of the reasons our grant is kind of unique is that we allow organizations to choose um, different funding amounts each year. Doesn't mean they'll get different funding amounts, um, but um, they certainly can do that. So um, we'll see it both directions. We'll see them increase their funding um, as year as the year goes on or re request for funding. Um, maybe they start off as a pilot project and then add more um, individuals um, and so need more funding as time goes on or they go the flip side. Maybe they're a startup uh, program and they need more money to start up um, and then less money in years two, two and three. Um, so uh, we do have a, a few organizations that do get um, different that currently are getting different amounts of funding um, depending upon the, the funding year. Um, but I would say a vast majority of them um, will ask for um, the same amount of funding all three years. And for the basic needs, will they count the number of individuals, count the unique number of individuals served? Will they? Yes. Um, yes, they will either count them or give an estimation. All, all of the programs all of them. Um, will either give us an actual um, unduplicated projected number or um, give us an, uh, an estimation of that unduplicated projected number. Yep. All right, uh, I will go back to the, the evaluation form. So our scoring is system is broken down from zero to four. With zero meaning they just straight up left the question blank and didn't didn't follow the directions. Two would be they really didn't demonstrate their answer wasn't really clear and it kind of lacked some specific examples. And four, you think it's the best answer you've ever seen written on a grant application. So you'll kind of, as you review these applications, you'll kind of slowly pick up um, and kind of, I guess, compare. I don't like to use that word, but compare what is kind of a stellar answer and what's not kind of a not so great answer by 
it by asking ourselves is are they answering specifically what the question is asking? All right, this is kind of our scoring chart process. So as uh, you may recall, the application score that y'all are reviewing is worth 30%. The financial review score is worth 20% and the grant review panel is 50%. So each review member will be, each reviewer will be reviewing four to five applications and the score of that one program is the average of all four to five reviewers. And if they meet a certain threshold, I believe during the application and financial portions, they will move on to the grant review panels. And this is an example of how the points are kind of tallied up. And um, here is an example of what the total weighted score is. So just because the program score the highest doesn't mean that they will automatically get awarded, uh, be a recipient of the grant. Uh, decisions are made once they've met that point threshold and their total weighted score is calculated. So when the advisory councils um, get the scores, the total scores, um, things that they do look at is the total score. Um, but they also need to look at um, the, the the distribution between Eau Claire and Chippewa counties. Um, so we need to we have a percentage in mind that we want to make sure that we stick kind of close to. Um, and then also um, the uh, the service itself. Um, you know, is is the service um, you know being offered or is there a service that's needed that you know might have scored a little bit less than a different service um so there's there's some of that that goes on a little bit of fine tuning is what i would call it so it's not just totally based on um totally based on the score um the advisory councils who are experts in the field um are also taking a look at that distribution and and also needs within the community united way also reserves the right to um seek out uh, if if nobody is able to provide the service that we think is important uh, or the advisory councils think is important, um, then we are, are able to seek that out through an organization um, directly. So uh, an example of that is the um, micro grants that we do with um, CVTC. Um, so for students who are in need of some smaller amounts of assistance, um, but assistance that are keeping them in their educational program at CVTC. Um, nobody applied for that. And so we um, sought out CVTC um, to actually do that. Um, and it's been a very successful program. Yeah. All right, next steps in this process. You will received an email a friendly reminder email during the week of July 26th. So that's in but roughly a week. <laughs> it's in about a week um, saying that the conflict of interest is on the way. So be on the lookout. If my emails get to sent to your quarantine box, then check it, that as well. Um, so conflicts of interest will be sent during the week of August 2nd. They must be signed and returned to us as soon as possible. Once we have your conflict of interest, you'll receive instructions on how to access Dropbox and also receive your review team assignment with the link for the Dropbox folder. And then you will also be um, notified of where to turn in your evaluation form. You will have between August to September to review the applications. And then you'll return the evaluation forms to us in September and then yay, you're done. All right, so what do we need to have first? What needs to be completed before you get your applications to review? Conflict of Conflict interest. Of interest. <laughs> Very good. 
Right. Any questions? Oh, um, let me also show you our website too. So if you want to look at some of the documents ahead of time. This is our lovely website, and if you go under our impact, you will get the Alice report. And if you click on one of them, you will find the Alice report for the specific county. And if you want to know about the request for proposal or application, it is under funding information. Our RFPs are available right here. And action plans as well. So all of the links for these, I believe, are in your training manual as well. Bam. So yes. um, you don't have to be writing all this stuff down feverishly. <laughs> Our contact yeah. information is in there. Yep. Um, utilize uh, utilize your training manual as you're going through this process. Um, once you get assigned uh, uh, your applications, um, I would highly recommend that you take a look at the action plan for that initiative. Um, it will just really set the tone um, for what the advisory councils and what United Way is looking for um, as you are, are doing your reviews. Um, so some good information in there. Um, there's a lot of data in there, but um, there's, you know, definitely some, you know, good information that will, you know, give you a really good idea of what of what we're we're looking for. <laughs> 